Welcome to the 77th edition of TLR Shows, Stand Out from the Digital Clutter. My name is John Godoy, and I will be your host for today's episode. I'm a professional speaker, communications coach, and co-founder of a workplace wellness product designed to make sitting healthier. TLR Shows is the flagship stream series brought to you by TLR Now, a coaching, consulting, and mentoring company based out of Pune, India. The mission of TLR Now is to bring to you dynamic and industry-leading thought leaders to help enhance your professional lives. Today, it is my great pleasure to introduce to you David A. Fields, consultant, speaker, and best-selling author, widely considered to be on the forefront of thought leadership of consulting firms. His book, The Irresistible Guides to Winning Clients, is listed number one on Book Authority's list of the best consulting books of all time. David's firms work with small consulting firms across the globe that want to accelerate growth and increase profit and helps build consulting practices that are lucrative and lifestyle friendly. He has guided consultancies ranging from the consulting divisions of some of the world's largest companies to independent boutique firms under 50 million to one person startup. David earned a bachelor's and master's degree from Carnegie Mellon University and he is an avid hockey fan and eats egregious amounts of chocolate. Please true. welcome David. <laughs> Thank you. And, but, and exactly true. As you and I were talking just before the show, um, yes, hockey fanatic. Uh, and I've already had a lot of chocolate. And it's right here where I am. It's first thing in the morning. So there oh, you go. It's perfect. It's easier. There's a lot of chocolate around. Fantastic. It's great to have you, David. Uh, let's get started off right away. We'd like to little, learn a little bit more about your journey and how you got to become essentially the consultant to consultants. How did you start your org organization? Okay. Um, yeah, I will, I will belabor this because I'm not sure watchers or viewers want to know that much about uh, background, but I'll give, you the, I'll give you the thumbnail version. Sure. So I did, I did a decade in corporate um, working for a consumer products firm, a large consumer products firm, and then went into consulting. I went into consulting 20... Um, 24 years ago, 26 years ago, something like that. A long time ago, um, because I'm old now. And uh, worked my way up to partner with a firm and then spun off and co-founded a firm of my own. So um, about, oh, I guess 15 years ago, the, the, I created something called the Ascending Consortium, which was all about uh, kind of being in the middle of clients and um, consultants and helping clients find the right consultants. This was before the days of Cadland, you know, hourly nurture and Cadland and all these sort of aggregators, which there are tons of now mm -hmm. um, that didn't exist so much in 2005. And so um, this idea of bringing consultants and creating a pool of consultants and bringing them to clients was uh, newer. So uh, I did that. And because I was doing that, because on every project I was, I was both a consultant to the client and a client hiring consultants. I became a, a quite avid student of how consulting works, why clients buy, what they buy, when it works, when it doesn't work. And uh, so that really started my journey. My first book was about that. Uh, and then along the way, consulting firms started to ask questions like, how is it you're able to win this business and win it at such a high fee? And I couldn't win it at all. <laughs> Um, and almost on a lark, John, I started working with consulting firms and, uh, you know, 10 years ago, 12 years ago, and that business ate my corporate business. And so for the past number of years, my firm has been exclusively focused on consulting firms and helping consulting firms grow. Uh, but it came organically. It, it came because consulting firms wanted the advice and, you know, that provided the platform to really study consulting firms and understand them. So my business is the business of consulting. Um, you know, other people's business, your business might be wellness. Uh, people's business might be marketing or promotion or operations. Our business is the business of consulting. Wow, that's really fascinating, David. Essentially, you were essentially the consumer of consulting, so you knew what that was, and so you decided to become now the vendor of it because you are intimately aware of what uh, uh, someone who's hiring a consultant needs. Very there interesting. you go. One of the things that I know about you is that you've written a couple of books. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about the books that you've written and why yeah. you, you wrote them? I have to tell you, I picked one up uh, probably about a year ago on someone's recommendation. And I, it was just 
a mind blowing book. It had five stars on Amazon, 365 reviews, all phenomenal. It was just yeah. a mind blowing book. Can you tell us a little bit about it? Sure. So that's probably my second book. My first book's also quite good. Uh, my very first book never got published, but my first book that was published is also good, but is a little bit denser, a little bit more of a text. And uh, more people know the book that you probably picked up, The Irresistible Consultant's Guide to Winning Clients. And, um, you know, I'm quite fortunate. I got, I got lucky. There, there are books that are good, and there are a tiny, tiny fraction, a sliver of books that are truly phenomenal. Um, that book happens to be in that that you know elite status. It's a truly phenomenal book, uh, in part because well we worked hard on it. I had a whole team working on it, but it's it's uh, hopefully your experience was it's very practical. I mean mm -hmm. it just tells you here's what to do to win clients. Um, no BS, no filler, just straight out. Here's what to do, um, and as a result, it, it's been it's been very useful for a lot of readers, which is gratifying, of course. Oh, it's phenomenal. It's just simply about simplifying, clarify your message. And here are some pictures that really help us sink into your mind. It was very powerful. We actually have a video on it uh, that we're we'll right. playing up for our audience now. Look at that. The video, exactly. <laughs> Recently. Surprise. Even better, even better the second time with more and jamming, jamming music. All right. Absolutely. Well, let's jump into the, the meat and potatoes of today's right. session. And you recently you penned an article, Stand Out from the Digital Clutter, a key lesson for consulting firms. And that's why everyone is here. They're dying to, to learn more about what is digital clutter and what they can do about it. So my first question to you is, what is digital clutter? All right. So uh, digital clutter is uh, is the world we live in right now. There are, um, can, can I back up and put it in some context? Please do, absolutely. Right. Uh, I, actually, I wanna show one kind of image or slide, which is actually, you know, it is I think illustrated in the book, but might be helpful. Um, I often talk to consultants about um, what I call the five marketing musts, which is how you market your consulting firm. And in, mar in consulting and probably other businesses, there are a few ways that are actually work really well. And, and I'll just cover them really quickly and it'll put digital clutter in some context. Okay. So the, the five marketing musts are writing, speaking, networking, trade associations, and digital presence. Writing, speaking, networking, trade associations, and digital presence. And uh, I'll show another uh, image that was in this article. These are, I mean, this, this is just what drives business. There's one that's non-negotiable, that's networking. So you have to do networking no matter what. The others, historically, you could maybe do, maybe not do um, and get away with it. But that changed. <laughs> that changed when lockdowns happened and, and the, the world happened. Because all of these things, you know, writing, you used to be able to write, and like, I have a book. And a lot of the times, my book was, was purchased in airports. People stopped flying. So my book sales in airports plummeted like all book sales in airports, speaking, you get up on stage. That's mostly disappeared. There's not on stage speaking. Instead, they're speaking like this, which mm -hmm. is digital, right? So all of these things turned into digital. Everything turned digital. And there is this, this uh, slide I put in here. I don't know if it's how visible it is. Let me uh, make it bigger. 
the, the, and I apologize, it may be a little fuzzy. This was kind of 2019, because I wrote this article in 2020, versus 2020. In 2019, people had all these kind of in-person ways of getting business and a little bit of digital. But once the pandemic hit, everything turned digital. And so once everything was digital, now it became extremely cluttered, right? It just became crazy, crazy cluttered. My um, understanding is at this point, there's something like 2 million podcasts. Wow. Which is, not, which, which is not to say that you should not launch a podcast. But just remember, there are 2 million of them. If you want to create video, if you were to upload video that you felt was compelling and you put it on YouTube, you have to remember that there's 500 hours of video loaded to YouTube every minute. Every minute. <laughs> Something like, I don't know, three quarters of a million hours of video are uploaded every day. Which means your 20-minute video, your webinar that you upload is buried, is a grain of sand on a, on a beach of content. <laughs> and so... Uh, clutter is, is to some extent, is people are constantly being bombarded now because there's no other way for your clients to receive information from you and everyone else other than digitally. The, the digital onslaught has become uh, kind of unbelievable. The, the, so that, that kind of sets the frame. Does that help? That absolutely does. And it's, it's, I think it's something that really resonates with a lot of people. I'm in, I'm in the speaking business and you're absolutely right. The speaking uh, face to face speaking industry completely disappeared. And so you're really trying to do everything you can as a consultant, as a small business owner to really become visible. But you just there's just so much stuff on LinkedIn, on YouTube, on Twitter, on, on all these things that your posts, they disappear. And it's, it's almost like it, you're, you're drowning. You're, you're just saying, hey, 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 look at me, look at me. But ultimately, it's just it's drowning in all that digital clutter, as you say. Right. Because there's a whole sea of people saying, hey, 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 look at me, look at me. And you know, you're one of many. So how do we stand out, David? <laughs> help, help. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so the, the, you can stand out. Um, and I think there are, there are a number of ways at this. The, the number one most important lesson, I would say, the most important thing to remember, because, and this is true of, in general in consulting, it's the number one principle in consulting is what we call right side up thinking, is to stay right side up. And that means remembering that your business, whether it's consulting or you're a coach or your teacher or your trainer or something like that, or a speaker, if you're a speaker, your speech is not about you. Your speaking is not about you. Your business is not about you. Your business is about them, mm -hmm. clients and prospects. And if you keep that in mind, and everything you do is with that in mind, that will already separate you from 99% of the other folks out there who are all out there promoting themselves because they think all their content is meant to be about them. If you make your content about your listener, your viewer, your reader, then you will stand out. So that's lesson one. I think lesson two is to say less, is to simplify. Clarify, be concise, write what you're going to write, and then cut it down to as few words as possible. Say what you're going to say, come up with your speech, and then eliminate five of the points so you can focus on one point or two points. And when you say less, it, 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 you know, it's all clarified. There was a, there was a famous ad um, campaign back in. I don't know, the 1970s, maybe 80s, 90s. I don't know. I'm, I'm, as you know, I'm pretty old now. So for, for uh, E.F. Hutton, and this may not make any sense to anybody uh, in, unless you're of a certain age, but they used to show these advertisements and there would be all these people in a room, you know, in a crowded restaurant, lots of noise and ambient noise and everybody talking. And then you'd have one person say, well, my broker is E.F. Hutton. And E.F. Hutton says, and, um, and the entire restaurant, right? Everybody would stop talking to listen. And it was this, it was the tagline was something like when E.F. Hutton talks, everyone listens, or I don't know what it was. But it was, you know, it was, the idea was memorable. If you speak quietly and you create great value, people will listen. So now, does that help? Not help? 
I think it does. I think that that's a very that's that gives us a perspective from a principle based perspective of like okay. help other people you know, imagine yourself as the customer. What would you want? And then simplify your message. Do you have any specific tactics on how one of our viewers or how I can do that? Do I do that in a blog? Do I do it on my website? Do, what do I do everywhere? So um, if we think let, let me go back up then to the see if I can get to the um, the marketing must. And um, so if you look at these, okay, so let's say you're writing, because we might as well just take it from right practically. Let's if you are writing a an article, the first thing you have to do is actually spend a lot of time, more time than you're spending right now, just on the title. That's true of your article, that's true of your speech. You must, must, must brainstorm your titles and come up with at least 10. And then if it's a book, for instance, you're going to want to test that title to make sure it cuts through. The title of my second book, which is The Irresistible Consultant's Guide to Winning Clients, I personally dislike. <laughs> I really don't like that title. <laughs> and I, um, I did everything I could to not have that title. We had contests coming up with titles. We brainstormed titles, but then we tested it, and that title always won. And so that's the title of the book. So you have to, so the first things first is make sure people will actually consume your content by focusing on those handful of words that are going to get people to pick up your content, click on your content, listen to your content, open your content. Let me ask you a question about that, David. Do you yeah. think uh, there's a different, there's one, one of our a consultants should look more towards being clever with their titles or no. being very straightforward because the title of your book is very straightforward. Maybe that's why yeah. you don't like it, but we know exactly what you do. How, yeah. how you, go ahead. It's what one, one of our clients calls a what's in the box title, meaning yeah. it just tells you what's in the box. The, um, I, I don't think there's, there's a single answer to that. Um, I think that, you want to be, you want to go up to the edge of clickbait, if you will, and then step back one half step. And then you have to deliver on whatever you promise. Of course, the, the problem with clickbait is clickbait is famous for drawing you in and then giving you something else, right? It's, a, it's kind of a bait and switch. You want to, whatever that title is, whether it's straightforward, a what's in the box title or something more provocative, you want to get, you know, do something that is hitting your prospects nerves there you're you're talking to them where they are one of our clients was in the uh was a veterinarian and in the in in the kind of the pet food industry and after a fair amount of work the the title she came up with for her kind of core speech was death in a can why your pet food is killing pets hmm. that's a provocative title it took her about six seconds to get booked because it was hitting the, her, the industry she targeted right where they live and right where they're concerned. So that's very provocative. Um, what I would not do is, is try to be too clever or make your, your uh, prospects work too hard to figure out what your title is about. That we're, we're not in the mystery game. It just um, But you can be provocative. Um, Interesting. We, spent, we spent a lot of time on that. Sorry, go on. I was just going to say, like in your book, one of the biggest things that I took away from it was this notion of don't try to solve a problem or try, try to teach a client that they have a problem. It's yeah. to go to an immediate pressing problem they have and address that. And perhaps yes. it becomes something you put in a title. What would you say? Uh, I'm sorry, say that last part again. So, you know, address a, pro a, a client's immediate, a prospect's immediate problem. And maybe yeah. that becomes the focus of your articles, your blogs, what you write about, yeah. and the titles address that pain point. Yes, that's absolutely right. So, right, that whole idea of fishing, what we call fishing where the fish are, which is, is dealing with clients or trying to address problems that they know they have. Um, yes, I agree with. And then, and then you come up with, okay, what title will, will, deliver on this content or we'll, we'll match it, but also draw people in. And so we spend a fair amount of time just working on what are, what are the titles for, for, you know, we put out an article every single week and uh, a fair amount of time is spent. Okay. We should be this title or that title. Does this make sense? Will this draw people in? What do we think? 
Um, we don't test every week, but for big things, we test. Hmm. And then what's probably surprising to people, again, just sticking on writing, for instance, is how much gets left on the cutting room floor. Um, I was showing, we, we have a, a fairly new principal in our group and um, who is starting to, to create content. And I, I was saying it always looks easy in retrospect. All the content we produced, I don't know, 400 articles, 500 articles, right? It's a lot. But then I said, take a look at our directory internally of all of the files that say draft on them that were never published. And it's huge. Because you have to, you write a lot or you develop your speech and then you have to cut out a lot. So literally you have to be willing to leave uh, stuff on the editing room floor. Can I share one other quick story on this? Please do. In terms of, of, of standing up in the clutter. So um, my first book, which was the executive's guide to consultants, which was about um, uh, how do you hire consultants, was... Uh, I, the, I was very fortunate with that one also. And I created a proposal and a whole bunch of publishers wanted it. And when you are, are pitching a book to publishers, you write a sample chapter. That's part of it. You do a whole outline, you say your platform, and then you give a sample chapter. So this sample chapter, which attracted numerous publishers to the book, uh, never made it into the book. Hmm. It's literally not in the book. It's the first thing I wrote. It's what got... And that's because it was never quite good enough. I rewrote it three times. It never communicated well enough. You have to be willing to do that with your own content. You have to be brutal and pare it down to what's truly, truly, truly going to be valuable and hard hitting for your clients, for your prospects. And if you do that, you'll stand out. May I ask you a question on that? So, yeah. so I, think, imagine, I imagine myself and other people are sometimes it seems almost futile. Like you're just putting lots and lots of content down to, out there and you're like, I hope it hits. I hope it resonates with the client. What is going through the client's mind when you're giving them all this great information? Are they going, oh, you know what? I see them all the time. They seem like a very knowledgeable expert. I may hire them later. Well, this is valuable. Let's see what I'm going to do with them perhaps in the future. What are they yeah. thinking? Yeah, uh, they're not thinking about you at all. Sorry. Um, so you're, you, you put out a lot of content. And a lot of the content you put out, uh, and I'm a fan of, of doing at least reasonable quantity. Um, not so much quantity that your quality is terrible. Um, enough quantity so that you're more likely to get the occasional brilliant piece. Again, whether it's writing or speaking, you'll deliver that occasional killer speech. The, um, however, the other purpose it serves, which is important, is just reminder advertising. And it's not that your client is going, oh, that's the piece of content I needed, though that will happen. It's that they're going, oh, yeah, I remember John. You know what? I should give John a call. We actually need John right now. And you, and you want to be top of mind enough so that when they have that need, they're thinking, oh, yeah, John, I, I should call John. And your, your, your content, ongoing content serves that purpose. Any bad content, no, no, let me, let me say it differently. Any mediocre content, good content that doesn't stand out, they just ignore it. They just forget about it. it. doesn't stay in their mind at all. And then and then you'll write that one piece or you'll make that one speech. You'll create that one webinar, that one video. That's exactly what they need at the right time. And then they'll contact you. We see that all the time. We see that every single week. Every week, there's a different person who goes, this was your best article ever. <laughs> this was exactly what I needed. It's like, all right. <laughs> Very right interesting. Time. Right time. All right. Quality and stay in their, their mind. That's fantastic. Yeah. What's, the, what's the second point? You have speaking there on the list? Oh, uh, let's, let's go over to the, uh, the board. Let's see what we got here. Um, so speaking, the, the same thing I would say in, in speaking is, again, cut it down. Be simpler. You, you can speak m much less quickly than I'm speaking right now and cover fewer points and you'll do better. Mm -hmm. Have a single point. Speak slowly. Let your audience engage with you on a single powerful lesson. So less is more. Absolutely the case to cut through digital clutter. Uh, there are some other uh, ideas in speaking. You, you probably know even better than I do because your business is a speaking business. Um, there are ways to, to cut through. I think the speaking world has become very, very difficult. 
in, you know, digitally. So that's challenging. Networking is all digital now. And so there's, there's, you know, no one can shake hands. I bet you, you know, you bump elbows or something like that. <laughs> yeah. So, um, you know, how do you stand out there by not bombarding people with sales content? Oh my gosh, if you're on LinkedIn and you think that sending your hardcore sales message is going to win you business, um, you're basically, you know, in, in the spam world. That doesn't help. That's not right side up. Right side up is saying, uh, sending a message saying, hey, John, congratulations. I noticed that last post got 300 views or whatever, right? That's about you. I'm speaking about you. Then you're willing to engage with me. Okay, so that's being right side up. Um, trade associations also have struggled uh, in the digital world. However, they are m even more looking for help. They're looking for content. They're looking for partners. People often wonder why trade associations is even on here. And, and the reason is because it works. <laughs> I mean, otherwise, I wouldn't put it in there. It, it happens to be, it, it's where your prospects and clients are congregated. It's where they come together and where they're talking about their pain points. And as a result, if you're listening, you can hear exactly what they need, exactly what they want to find out from you. And there's an easy way to reach them. And then digital presence is everything we do now, right? It's your website, it's your social media, it's your podcast, your videos, your, you know, everything. Uh, and it's the digital version of, of all of this other stuff. Does that make sense? Too many scribbles? No, it makes absolutely sense. David, let me ask you this question. So yeah. we have, let's say you have a, a new consultant just starting the business or someone who's been in the industry for a long time and they're just swamped with, with work. And they really don't have time to do all these things. Is there an area that you would say, target this first? If you only have one thing you can do every week or two things, this is the area that I would suggest you to target to build your yeah, business. Well, if you're swamped with work, what you should be targeting is uh, systemizing your work so you can delegate it. Interesting. Because your job is to continue winning business. Delivering business is much easier than winning business. And therefore, so I know this isn't really what you asked, but, but the answer, if you want to scale or if you want to grow, is to you get yourself out of the world of constantly being de the delivery person. Hmm. Um, then you can do more of the stuff I was showing you. And when you do more of the stuff that I was showing you, you can win more, more work. And, uh, and, you know, you can do better uh, content. You can, you can stand out better. So if you're overwhelmed with work, learn how to streamline your work. That's what I would say. Wow, it's interesting, David. It sounds like you're saying that ideally the primary role of the consultant is to become business development, to bring in business, and then systemize your processes and hand that down to other people within your organization. Ideally, you bring them on so you can just focus on bringing in more clients. Would that be correct? Yeah, if you, it depends what you want to do. It depends what your goal is, what your aspirations are. If you want to build a firm, if you want to grow your, your revenue, then you, you have to be the primary business developer. That's, uh, I work with hundreds and hundreds of firms from you know, startups to 100, $125 million that range. And I can tell you that is the absolute rule. There's no one who can win business the way you can if it's your business. Huh. And if you're not good at it, then learn to do it. I mean, get get the, that book. Um, if, however, you want your business to stay small and just be completely lifestyle and you're okay with real fluctuations, you're okay with a business that's really up and down, you know, then work when you work and when you're, when you're done working, you know, do your marketing, recognize there's a gap, there's a lag period between the time you market and the time you win business. Um, so it depends a little bit on your aspirations. But if you want to grow, yeah, you, you need to to learn to be in the business development game and let other people be in the delivery game. Interesting. I, I remember here, I think it was Mark Cuban or someone who said, uh, no sales, no, <laughs> no company, no consultancy. That kind of sounds yeah. good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, consulting, consulting is a very simple business. Consulting at its core only has two pieces. It's, it's, a, it's a little spinning arrow. Um, and the spinning arrow at the top is win engagements. And at the bottom is uh, profitably create value. If you cannot win engagements, you do not have a firm, you, no matter how much value you create. 
because you don't have anybody to create it for. Now, if you cannot profitably create value, you can still have a firm, but it's a challenging firm because you, you churn through clients. Uh, simple business. Huh. Win business, create value. Do you have an example, David, of, a, of perhaps a, a consultant or a consultancy that you've worked with and perhaps some of the stages that you took them through and where they started? Perhaps they were a bit of a mess or why they came to you and how you helped them? Oh, my gosh. Um, we have hundreds of examples. <laughs> uh, so let me pick one. Um, yeah, so there's actually – I'll talk about a relatively small firm that um, we started with when they came to us. So down in Virginia in the U.S., and uh, a very, very interesting firm. The work they do is fairly scientific. The leader of the firm, who is a PhD, the founder, uh, extremely smart and respected in his field, uh, but could not get business and, and was losing money. So when uh, it was, what's interesting to me is an unusual, is that when they came to us and when the, when the owner especially came to us, um, they were in debt. They were on the verge of closing down. And usually by that time, it's too late to come to us because, um, you know, now you're talking about another investment. Uh, and the, the founder said, look, I'm betting everything on you, <laughs> which is a lot of pressure, <laughs> by the way. Um, and we have, um, well, so the firm was so low, it's almost, it almost wasn't a base. We have built that firm up, um, I want to see like seven to 10 X. Um, oh. Over the past past two and a half years, um, they're transitioning to a new stage for us. So we, we think about businesses as kind of um, anything below a million and a half dollars. We, we classify as a solo. Um, a boutique starts at about a million and a half, too. And then we do a lot of two to five work. How do you take your firm and go from two million to five million, which is really fun? And then how do you go from five to ten? How do you go from ten to twenty five? And then, you know, you keep you keep bumping up. And because the problems are somewhat predictable at each stage, or at least they're common. Uh, and so actually right now, today, I'm delivering to that consultant, which is why he's on my mind, uh, and that firm, a uh, plan for how we're going to now enter into the next stage. So they went from being in debt, struggling, couldn't get business, to we're hiring as quickly as we can. We're trying to figure out how to deal with um, – adding a branch internationally, a branch based in Europe, um, and um, working them through kind of what are the, the intricacies of that. I will tell you, uh, a lot of what we're talking about here, breaking through the digital clutter, was part of that. Um, pricing, as always, was a big part of that. Clarifying the offer, uh, doing what I call impact work, uh, a big part of that. Hmm. I don't you, know if that told you what you wanted to know, but I think it does. I think it does. Uh, it gives us an example of kind of how we visualize how you work, moving from those different segments in terms of revenue. And you actually hit on something. You said uh, content clutter. In, in the article, you talk about the difference between content clutter and message clutter. Can you tell us a little bit about that and how we can avoid that? Sure. So we've been talking mostly about content clutter, mostly, right? There's just a ton of content out there. Um, and you need to stand out from the content. But one of the ways you stand out, and actually this firm down in Virginia is a pretty good example, uh, is by reducing your message clutter. And message clutter is when you want to say, you say, I do, um, I, I do, we do strategy and we do planning and we do delivery and we're nuts and bolts and we're everything you need and, and we do marketing and your operations and for every industry, right? That is message clutter. There is no clarity in that. The more commas and conjunctions and ands and alsos you have, the less you're saying, mm -hmm. the less impact you have. You're diluting, essentially. Absolutely right. So message clutter is creating all of that extra stuff. It's, it, what it's born out of is this fear that you're going to, you're going to lose out. Here, let, let me show you one thing quickly, and then um, just to illustrate this. Okay, so let's just say there's this, and I'm, I have to, my, uh, obviously my thing is over here, so I have to look over here to draw. Um, let's say that this is kind of the universe of uh, potential projects, okay? What most people will decide is, okay, what I'm going to try to do is I'm going to try to have a message that's broad enough to, to cover 
you know, I, hopefully I'll get a bunch of them, right? If I'm broad enough. But that's not how consulting is purchased. When you do that, when you try to not lose opportunities, what happens is you lose all of the opportunities because this one here is bought by, uh, is won by a specialist in that problem. And this one here is won by a specialist in that problem. And this one, and this one, and this one, they're not won by one company. They're won by individual companies, each of which is a specialist. Because unless a firm is going to an Accenture or a Deloitte, which is not your competition, that client is looking for somebody who is specialized in what they do. So talking about all five of these things, that is message clutter. Getting rid of it and saying, you know what, we don't do everything. What we do is uh, we do this. We do this one piece here. That's clarifying. That helps you win business. So th that's that's kind of what I mean by by uh, message clutter. Yeah, no, that, that's actually a very powerful visual. It sounds to me like you're saying just really, really specialize. Find out who that yep. customer is, and don't try to do be everything to everybody. Don't be everything to everybody. That's a very well. Not if, not if you want to win business. And not if you want. To, well, <laughs> that's true. Uh, David, I have another question for you. So a lot yeah. of uh, our our audience members are students. And they may not necessarily be a consultant right now. They may be going yeah. into it, but they're facing their own little bit of a, a challenge right now. And that is to stand out amongst the digital clutter of resumes of people applying for jobs to try to win that internship. Do you have any message for them on how they can yeah. use sharing to get a job, perhaps land an internship? Yeah, here we go. Okay. This is, you're going to have to deal with my writing here. Okay. So um, it's, not about you. It's not about you. <laughs> if you want to get a job, you want to get an internship, you want to stand out, remember your resume is not about you. I know you think it is. I know you think you're, you're supposed to, to show how great you, know, you are. It's not about you. Right? So the, uh, the mistake I think a lot of youngsters make, and not just youngsters, a lot of people who are later in their career make, is they try to say, look how creative I am. Look how different I am. I stand out. But remember, someone who's hiring you doesn't want you to stand out as much as they want you to fit in. You have to show them that not that you're amazing, but that you can help them be amazing. Show you're an A-plus player. Show that you deliver what they want to achieve. Right? They're, um, I, I can tell you because we're hiring. <laughs> right? We're looking for A-plus folks. We're looking for, for batteries included, people who have energy and will help us achieve our goals. And yes, along the way, I hope that my employees and my staff achieve their goals. Right? That's important. But I can't hire people just to help them achieve their goals. They have to help my business first. That's true of every business. Sure. Every business is wondering, how can you help me? And so your first goal in your resume, in any of your content, is to demonstrate that you can help them, that you're reliable and credible and, and, and you know, all of those sorts of pieces. How so would, is, you know, that's my thought. No, that's a very powerful thought. How, do you, how would you demonstrate to, some, that, to somebody on, on, an e, on a resume that perhaps they just, they have a template, and they're applying to 10, 20, 30 different companies, do, you, do they tailor each resume and then they write out the content Ooh. and reframe it from the perspective of the company? What do they do? Yeah, so um, to be completely fair, you are absolutely talking outside of my area of expertise. I see. <laughs> <laughs> okay, because I do not deal with a lot of youngsters out of school um, in, in resume writing. So uh, I want to really caveat this by saying, that you've probably talked to experts who know this better. Um, it, it, if I sort of translate my guidance for established firms and established professionals over to, to students, what I would say is at from the very start that you know often in resumes there's this piece at the top that talks about you know what what the the person wants, what they're looking for. You know, I'm looking for a job that lets me grow, kind of stuff, right? That's about you, that's, not, that's upside down. If you really want to stand out, take that first paragraph 
and make it about the people you're trying to work for. If you're a high growth firm and you want to grow even faster with a smart, hardworking player, then I'm your person. That's a hell of a lot more appealing to me as an employer than hearing that you want to be able to grow. I get it. I get that you want to grow, right? So make, make it about them. Start with a you statement. If you are this, or you're an operations firm and you're looking for a hard charging new student that will uh, play, play nicely with the team, uh, that is about what they're looking for, not about what you're looking for. Uh, that's, that's kind of where I would start. Now you can tell me that's dead on wrong because like I said, I'm not an expert in it. Um, oh. and I would say, okay. I, I wouldn't say you, you're absolutely right. Perhaps you're, you are absolutely right in saying you're not an expert to it, but I think a lot of what you're saying is, is it fundamentally, they're almost universal principles on how to market yourself, your organization. It, some people might say it's common sense, but it's not common sense and that not everyone applies it, but make it about the, the audience, make it about your customer, stand out from the clutter, do things from the perspective of the other person. It's, it's a very powerful thing. And I think it translates to different industries. So thank you very much for sharing that, uh, David. I guess yeah, the next question I have for you is, as, as we're kind of winding down today's interview, what would be one thing if, if an individual were to take away just one message from today's uh, talk, what would it be something that they can apply to their, their consultancy right away that they will uh, see dividends, whether immediately or relatively soon down the road? Any suggestions? You bet. Okay. So even though this is scrawled and it's messy, here's the, the, the key message is it's, it's not about you. Um, that, that's that's the thing to remember. Okay, it's not about you. Um, your business is not about you, and the more you remember that, the more you apply that to your own practice, the better off you'll be. By the way, that's a very very difficult idea to put into practice. It sounds simple. However, making your language you focused is challenging. If you take a look at, uh, read any of my articles, you'll see there, uh, there's never theory and they're never about me, even though they'll, they'll all be about chocolate. Uh, they're always about you. They're always about the reader. The more you focus your business on what your prospects want, not what you want to do, what they want, not what you want to sell, what they want to buy, the easier this whole business is. Interesting. My takeaway from that is just, Serve, 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 serve your customer. Do whatever you can to help them and frame all what you do for them. And that'll yeah. lead to business. Yeah, and listen. And listen. listen. You're going to serve them, but to serve them, you have to know what they need. And that means listening to them first. Oh, that's very powerful, David. Thank you very much. And I'm sure our audience is, is very, very grateful to, to learn that. I'm going to take this moment in case there's anybody uh, listening who has any questions, please feel free to add them to the chat as we close. If any pop up, we'll ask them to David. I'm going to ask David one more question. Is there anything else that you'd like to, to share with the audience? Just the final message uh, as we continue through this pandemic, through the lockdown, we try to build our businesses, our consultancies. Um, that's a pretty broad question, John. <laughs> yeah. well, I'm trying to get some more well, some questions. Show up during the <laughs> and anything else? Um, <laughs> yeah, look, the, the, the consulting business, and again, that's what I speak to. And, and I, this is true for coaches and, and trainers and mentors and all of that. Um, it's a very simple business, but it's not an easy business. Okay, it's a simple business. You, you win engagements, you profitably create value. You have some infrastructure underneath that holding that cycle up and a strategy. You have a consulting firm or you have a coaching firm. So it, it's very simple. However, it's not easy. And what I would suggest is um, if you're new at it, you have to give it time. There is a solid 12 months of, of straight up learning before you really understand what the business is about. So if you're really new at it, take that time to learn uh, and invest in yourself. Uh, John, I am sure you have a coach. Um, I have always had a, a business coach and, and have one now who's actually up in Canada. Um, I know you're from... Uh, uh, Canada. So, uh, you know, to, to try to build something on your own, especially in a difficult environment, 
without guidance from someone who has been there, who's done that, who can think differently from you, who has some expertise you don't have, I, I think would be crazy. Um, so give it time and, and make sure you're, you're investing in, in doing it with folks who can help. Interesting. Give it time and, and work with someone can, who can help accelerate the, the speed at which you, you get to where you need to do without yeah. as, making as many mistakes. Yeah. And that, and that could, you know, obviously it could be an expert like us, but it doesn't have to be. It, sure. it, it can be, um, the only thing I would be very careful of is just doing it with peers because walking blithely down the trail to, to the chasm of doom with your friends who are just as clueless as you are, that's not a great idea. Um, so at least find someone who has been down that path before and can say, don't go that way. Down yonder path is doom, <laughs> right? <laughs> you know, someone who's made the mistakes. Like we, we can help people because we probably made every mistake in, you know there is. Absolutely. Well, David, I, I really want to thank you for taking time out of your day. I know it's very difficult to secure your time to, to, to be here with us and share your insight and your expertise and your journey with us. Some really valuable tools. And so with Great. that, we're going to sign off. And I'm going to say, for everyone listening, please follow TRLR now at LinkedIn, Facebook, YouTube, and Instagram, and Twitter to stay updated with upcoming shows. This is John Godoy signing off. Stay vigilant, safe, healthy, and happy. Bye-bye. <laughs>